psychology is research. It really is, and I hate to admit that because I'm a teaching psychologist and not a research psychologist. But the reality is we only know what we know because people do research. Uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, how you study uh, cultural psychology. And this is, of course, Chapter 4, or how it's done. Uh, oh, I got that. Okay, there we go. Okay. What should always be an initial step in studying people from other cultures is to learn something about the culture under study. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way in avoiding costly and embarrassing mistakes. Schrader and his colleagues in 1997 were researching family meals. They sought information from rural India and called ahead to optimize their time there. Though people in this area of rural India did not participate in family meals, an obliging local psychologist convinced a family to sit down at a table to s simulate what the researchers were looking for. The researchers happily recorded their discovery and mistakenly included it in their research. In other words, this was it was not true. <laughs> It was them trying trying to give them what the, what the uh, researchers wanted. This is what they saw. Uh, they even found a table to put it on. It looks like a family meal, but this is the way they actually eat in India. They don't eat as families. They eat as uh, uh, age group cohorts. So uh, the older males eat with the older males. The younger males eat with the younger males. And women eat with... Uh, with each other as well as the children being fed whenever the children are fed. One can learn about another culture in a variety of different ways. The simplest way is to read existing texts and ethnographies about the culture. But, but this, is a, this is a warning, and, and this is something that happened to me when I moved to, uh, to Montana uh, to work on the uh, Fort Belknap Reservation. Uh, there were there were books that had been written in the, in the uh, at the end of the nineteenth uh, century, uh, begin, before the beginning of the before the twentieth century, of course, and uh, they were they theoretically talked about uh, the uh, Grovant or White Clay or uh, Ani uh, culture, uh, but some of it had to do with the uh, prejudices of the uh, of the authors, the author. Uh, was a priest from Washington, D.C., uh, and some of it had to do with the uh, Ani people telling him what he wanted to hear. Uh, part of it had to do with, well, yeah, we can't tell you that, that's a secret, you know, that kind of a thing, so they told him something else. Uh, so you, you need to understand that sometimes the information you're looking for, you, you cannot be privy to. And that's one of the things that we need to be aware of, that uh, we need to be aware of who wrote it, uh, how close to the culture were they, uh, did the culture have to hide anything from them? I mean, you know, uh, being Diné people, you understand that uh, there are certain things that uh, people from the outside will not understand because they, they cannot speak the, uh, the uh, Diné language. Uh, the Navajo language. And since they can't speak the language, they really don't understand uh, what you're talking about because it doesn't really translate uh, very well into, uh, into English or Spanish or French or German. So this is one of the things that you have to understand when we are talking about cultures. Uh, we could talk about you know, the Siberian culture, uh, but there's, a, you know, and we can read about it and we could look at pictures about it, but potentially what we're going to, to uh, understand is, or we're, what we're not going to understand is some of the things that are nuanced, the, the, the uh, a part of their culture that, uh, that other people cannot become privy to. Another approach is to find a collaborator who is from the culture you are studying and who is interested in pursuing the same research with, with you. Uh, the more involved your collaborator is in the project, the more likely you will get accurate information. The International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology is an organization of researchers studying culture and psychology from all around the world, and its members routinely find members from other countries to collaborate with 
on cross-cultural projects. Another effective strategy is to immerse oneself in another culture to learn it firsthand. This is an excellent way to gain a rich understanding of another culture, but it can be time-consuming and costly. There is no substitute for firsthand experience, uh, but uh, taking off your, sh your shirt and running around like the people uh, that you're dealing with, uh, is that really you? I mean, is this really her? Is, is uh, going topless... Is, is this really who she is? And if it's not, then she really shouldn't be doing it. In 1997, Patricia Greenfield was doing field research about the making of textiles in Mexico. She gave the Zinacantecos uh, women the same survey about their textile making that she had, had used all over the world. The women became angry. The Zinacantecos women approached the survey as they would a conversation. When Greenfield asked similar questions, a methodological sound interview technique, they, sought, uh, they thought that she was stupid or making fun of them, and it made them angry. So because of her conversational style, she, uh, they, they, uh, uh, the researcher angered the women. Having your methods uh, perceived in identical ways across different cultures is termed methodological equivalence. Sometimes researchers have to adapt their procedures so that it is understandable in each culture equally. The vast majority of cross-cultural research has been conducted between industrialized societies. The most common comparisons are between North Americans and East Asians. The East Asians are the Chinese, the Koreans, and the uh, Chinese. Studying college students from different cultures also lends itself to making meaningful comparisons as students the world over tend to be familiar with many of the kinds of procedures used in psychological studies. The college students tend to be an accessible sample for most university researchers and they are cheap. You can give them, uh, the way you pay them is by giving them a grade or giving them credit. When researchers overemphasize college students, there tends to be a significant problem with generalizability. The research can't be generalized with any populations other than other college students. Okay, so, and this is and this is a, a continuing problem because uh, uh, most uh, professors, uh, most researchers, ha ha do not have enough money to be paying everybody. Uh, that they want to uh, to do their research on. So they use college students, and then they generalize it, or they try to. But can you really do that, uh, especially in a, in a classroom full of traditional students? Now, traditional students are students who go directly from high school right into uh, college. Uh, so they tend to be 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, 22 years old. Uh, they tend to be relatively young. The non-traditional students, uh, the, most of the students that we have at Diné College, uh, are older. They're, they're in their uh, middle, their late 20s, the, uh, maybe their 30s or 40s, and of course that's fine. We have non-traditional students. Uh, but most, most colleges, uh, most of their students are traditional students. And this is a problem because 18 to 22 year olds, you know, how much life experience do they have? Uh, do they really understand what they're talking about? Their brains aren't completely mature yet. Uh, the human brain doesn't uh, doesn't completely mature until they're in their uh, in their middle 20s. So what are we do? What are we doing here? We're doing all this research especially psychological research, uh, on, on people that, uh, that haven't really lived yet. Overusing students affects power. Power reflects the quality of the design of the study and determines if your design is sensitive enough to identify the anticipated effects. Sometimes the hypothesis is correct, but the design doesn't uh, have the power to be able to provide support for it. So if I have you do a... Um, uh, article critique, uh, one of the things that I ask you is, what is the population and and who is the population? 
does this population reflect what the uh, researchers say it reflects? Um, you know, potentially you're dealing with uh, you know 15 to to 19 year olds, and uh, uh, does what does that reflect? Does does is that uh, can you generalize that to a total population? And the answer is probably no. The other thing is that uh, most uh, research is regional. Uh, in other words, it's done in uh, California, it's done in Arizona, it's done in Mississippi, it's done in uh, Nebraska, it's done in Kansas, um, it's it's done in uh, New York City, uh, it's done in Virginia uh, or Florida. Uh, this research is done in Florida. Are the kids in Florida the same as the kids in Mississippi, as in California and Arizona, as in Washington State and Montana? And the answer is probably no. And for that reason, a lot of the research that is done by psychologists is not, uh, you can't really generalize it. You can only say this population is, uh, uh, this, this is a, re a reflection of this population and not any other population. In cross-cultural studies, culture should always be an independent variable. If researchers con contrast two similar cultures, they would not have as much variance in their independent variable as if they had compared two very dissimilar cultures. Psychological concepts do not always translate from one culture to the next. Japanese ame, which is the Japanese word ame, has no equivalent in English, inappropriate behavior that shows dependence on someone else. The German word schadenfreude has no uh, equivalent in English. Uh, pleasant, it's a pleasant feeling you get when you see someone, else, uh, someone else's pain. Uh, ephalic, uh, fago, the ephalic word fago has no equivalent in English. Fago is a mark of maturity that shows compassion for the weak and love and sadness for them. The Chinese have no translation for the word self-esteem. It doesn't exist in the Chinese concept. And of course, we can see poor translations all around the world. This is a, uh, a sign that was seen in a Chinese hotel. Please don't uh, accept stranglers' invitation so as not to be cheated. Uh, stranglers, huh? Uh, sign in a Chinese store. Please don't touch yourself. Let us help try you out. In other words, <laughs> what they meant to say <laughs> was... Please don't, please don't touch the merchandise yourself. Please let us help you. <laughs> That's what they meant to say. Didn't quite come out that way. Uh, sign in the Cambodian hotel, wishing you a bon voyage. They just put an extra G. It's supposed to be bon voyage, which is a, 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 good, uh, a good trip. And, of course, the way they said it, it sounds like they are or uh, smoking marijuana or something else. Uh, sign in a Hong Kong bathroom for keeping toilet clean and tidy. Please dump at the, at the dustbin. Uh, they meant dump your trash, but of course, dump can be taken in more than one way. Uh, sign in a Japanese street. When carrying a parasol, please be careful to get in the way of other people around you. Be careful to get in the way of other people. Be careful not to get in the way of other people. Uh, sign in a Japanese drugstore. We make up prescriptions. Mm, no, they fill prescriptions. They don't make them up. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, sign in a Bucharest hotel. The lift is being fixed for the next day. During the time, we regret that you will be unbearable. And <laughs> we can't. <laughs> During the time we regret that we can't carry you is what they meant, not unbearable. Uh, sign in a Paris hotel. Please leave your values at the front desk. <laughs> okay. Sign in an Athens hotel. Visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of 9 and 11 a.m. daily. Uh, so, okay. Sign in a Japanese hotel. You were invited to take advantage of the chambermaid. Uh, I don't think they meant quite that. Uh, sign in a Paris dress shop. Dresses for street walking. Street walking, of course, is, uh, is, is, is prostitution. Uh, the reason I gave you, I, I showed this picture. This is really kind of interesting. When I was living in Germany, 
we were we were st I was stationed there for three years. Uh, when I was living in Germany, this is back in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. Um, there were prostitutes who, who stood along the street, and it was it's perfectly legal in Germany. As a matter of fact, there was a brothel down the road uh, from the uh, the what was, what they call it forty mark Strasse is what they called it because there were so many prostitutes along the road. Anyway, uh, so how could you tell the difference between somebody who's hitchhiking, uh, a female who's hitchhiking, and a female who's a prostitute? And the way that you could tell was not by the way she dressed. It was the fact that she crossed her ankles. Uh, if you cross your ankles, it me it means that you're uh, you're you're at that moment you're closed for business. But uh, but that is your job, and you will open for business for a price. Anyway, that's that's really kind of curious. Uh, so if you want to know about prostitutes in in Germany, I never I never partook. I didn't need to. I was married at the time. Certainly, I'm married now to the same woman, as a matter of fact. Anyway, uh, I just thought that was kind of curious. So this lady's a streetwalker. Uh, sign in a German campground. It is strictly forbidden on our Black Forest camping site that people of different sex, for instance, men and women, live together in one tent unless they are married with each other for that purpose. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's pretty involved. <laughs> uh, uh, Soviet Weekly newspaper, there will be an, uh, a Moscow ex ex exhibition of arts by 15,000 Soviet Republic painters and sculptors. These were executed over the past two years. Uh, they didn't really execute all the artists <laughs> and sculptors. The works of art were executed. That's what they wanted to say. Uh, sign in a Mallorca shop. Here's speeching American. They speech American. That's great. I'm hoping they met here. Here we speak American. Uh, even for relatively fluent speakers, word choice can be a problem. Uh, the most commonly used method of ensuring that a translation is accurate is to have someone translate the translation back into English. This technique is known as the back translation method. Response biases are factors that distort the accuracy of a person's response to surveys, and they become especially problematic when we compare groups that differ in their response biases. Some people will try to seem more socially desirable in their answers and disguise their true feelings to appear more socially desirable. And this is one of the reasons why, we, and we keep talking about this when we're talking about shooters, people that have... Uh, uh, do mass shootings. Uh, people don't always uh, present the real person that they are. Uh, when I talk to my neighbor, I might I might uh, uh, only say nice things, but then uh, you know go out and shoot uh, f five or six people, and then my neighbor will say, "Well, these seem like the nicest guy." Well, yeah, in front of you, but uh, you know that's not always the way it works. There is a tendency for people from different cultures to vary in terms of how likely they are to express their agreement in a moderate fashion. Choosing an item close to the end of the scale, extremity bias, choosing an item in the middle of the scale, and this is known as moderacy bias. Uh, so some people uh, either strongly agree or strongly disagree. Other individuals will be somewhere in the middle. And for that reason, uh, a lot of uh, surveys that, uh, that have these types of answers uh, aren't very accurate. African Americans and Hispanic Americans tend to, to give more extreme responses than Americans of European descent. East Asians tend to be more moderate in their responses than the European Americans. East Asians show a greater moderacy bias when they complete the materials in their native language than when they complete them in English. One way to fix moderacy and extremity bias is by having the respondent answer yes or no, rather than using a Likert type uh, like scale. Though it is hard to quantify yes and no answers, and of course that's the way it works. A tendency to agree with uh, most statements is known as acquiescence bias and is an issue for cross-cultural comparisons. The acquiescence bias is a problem for cross-cultural research 
because cultures differ in their tendencies to agree with items. East Asians tend to have a relatively holistic way of looking at the world, and one consequence is that there are more possible truths in a holistic world. Uh, this uh, tends to make them see truth in almost all statements. People tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves with others. Usually it's people that they, they live around. Uh, so if you think of, of, uh, of yourself, you probably think of yourself in comparison with your brothers and sisters. You may think of yourself uh, in comparison with the uh, people that you graduated from high school with. Uh, you may think of yourself in comparison with uh, uh, the other military people that you served with. Uh, we all have similar others, and we all create similar others. Now, this can be a, a really interesting problem. Uh, thinking back on my high school days, I really don't compare myself with anybody from my high school, but I went to college, too, so do I compare myself with anybody in my uh, at, at my college? And the reality is, you know, I've moved around so much uh, that I don't really compare myself with anyone. It would be kind of self-destructive at this point. But a lot of people will live their lives trying to make their high school friends impress their high school friends, uh, to be like their high school friends, as weird as that is. And that's what we're actually what we're talking about. I am probably an anomaly. Uh, most everybody has a group of people that they are trying to impress, uh, that they're trying to live up to. Uh, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's somebody that they've met, sometimes it's their friends. It really all depends on what type of a person they are. Uh, but of course, as somebody who's moved around a lot, I do not do that. <laughs> I'm not sure who I would compare myself to. When we are assessing ourselves in terms of how tall, intelligent, or punctual we are, what matters is how tall, intelligent, or punctual we view ourselves compared to most other people around us. And this is kind of true. When I was growing up, uh, uh, I can remember uh, as I was growing up, the tallest person at our school uh, was about six feet tall, was only about six feet tall. Now, this is back in the 50s, of course. Um, and then we had a guy that was six foot two, and he, of course, was center on the basketball. Actually, he was a power forward on the basketball team, really good basketball player. Um, went away to college, and he was too short to play. He's only six foot two. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, people from my area of, of Indiana. Now, why in the world were the people so short? Well, I'm not exactly sure. We were all of English and German descent. Most of us were of uh, English and German descent. And so where were all the tall people? Well, they were someplace else, obviously. Uh, they were certainly not in my hometown. Um, but, you know, it's really kind of interesting. The other, the other thing to think about was that uh, I was, uh, my uh, elementary school class, uh, my high school class, the people that I went to school with for 12 years, in that group were 18 people who scored, uh, scored genius on IQ tests. Uh, now, when you, you're dealing with, and this was a rural school, and we were all uh, we, uh, we were all farm kids and factory workers kids, and it was it was quite a uh, uh, a strange situation. I mean, there was no no other school in the area that had that kind of a, a breakdown of uh, of the uh, kids in the class. Uh, Eighteen out of seventy two kids, uh, and I haven't ever divided that out, but I guess I probably should. Let me see if I can find. Uh, that's a lot. That's a pretty high percentage. Uh, most uh, most classes would have about 5%. That's 18 divided by 72 equals. That's 25%. 25% of the people in my uh, graduating high school class were scored high, scored genius. Uh, as weird as that sounds, so the competition, the you know, the competition was amazing. Drove the teachers crazy. They they had to bring in special teachers to teach us. Um, 
they weren't very good. <laughs> and I didn't really realize it until I went away to college. And then I'm here, I'm comparing myself to everybody else. I'm going, wait a minute. Everybody in my class was this smart. What's going on? Uh, reference group effect is, is critical for cross-cultural research because people from different cultures tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves to different reference groups and thus to different standards. Understanding the reference group conundrum, the researcher should always be aware of the reference group effect. Who are we comparing ourselves to? Uh, I, I would you know, you go into the military and, of course, you're comparing yourself to all the people in your in your basic training unit. And then you're uh, you're comparing yourself with everybody in your in, in all of the uh, uh, classes that you're in. And you go, wait a minute, there's this is interesting. This is really kind of kind of fascinating. So you're, you're not really comparing yourself with your high school people. That's not your. Potentially, that's not your reference group anymore. One of the problems that I've seen with reference group effect is that a lot of people compare themselves to the uh, people that were in their high school, uh, their cohorts, their, their high school graduating class, and they can't break away from this group of individuals. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems is if that group was uh, doing something illegal or doing something uh, self-destructive. A uh, good example is Daryl Strawberry. Daryl Strawberry uh, grew up in the same neighborhood with uh, running back from the Cowboys. Uh, anyway, Daryl Strawberry went back. Oh, Daryl Dar Strawberry, uh, Dwight Gooden, and uh, uh, Emmett Smith, that was the guy's name. They all grew up in the same neighborhood. Not at the same time, but they grew up in the same neighborhood. Uh, Dwight Gooden and Daryl Strawberry tended to go back and show off for their friends. They were trying to impress their friends. Emmett Smith uh, went to Dallas and uh, didn't go back. He just didn't go back. And Emmett Smith is has never had any problems with drugs, but uh, Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden did. Uh, they started using drugs. They were athletes, and then they went back home and they were, didn't want to be better than their friends, so they, they started using drugs. Uh, so this can really be a problem. If you're one of those individuals that has to be the same as everybody around you, um, and uh, you know this can be a really serious problem. And I can remember thinking about this when I was a kid. I was thinking, you know, these aren't the nicest people in the world. Why in the world would I want to be, try to impress this group of individuals? I mean, if they're going to reject me, and this is that's what happened. I can. It's an interesting story, being abandoned at a basketball tournament. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a sad story. Uh, but the reality is, you know, you got to pick your reference group, and you got to be very careful about it. And I remember thinking about this when I was in the the fifth or sixth grade. Uh, do I really want to hang out with these people, and should they be the people that I try to emulate? And the answer I came up with was no. So I kind of, kind of became a loner. So it's been easy for me uh, since I don't have any, I don't accept references. I don't accept people uh, telling me how I should act. Um, and so I can act any way I, 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 I think is appropriate, and I don't have to listen to these people. And of course, I had a friend. I had, I've had lots of friends. I'm, I'm a fairly friendly person, but I don't accept them telling me what how I should act, that I should drink or that I should smoke or that I should take drugs or any of that stuff. I've just rejected that out of course because, well, anyway. Uh, but I had a friend that uh, still had a problem with, with this. Uh, he was in the Air Force, and uh, he served for 20 years, got out of the service, was getting his retirement pay, went back home, and by golly, he just drifted right back into that. Um, he's from West Virginia. And he drifted right back into where he was before he, he uh, joined the service. And he's dead now because he had a heart attack smoke so everybody smoked cigarettes and he wanted he had to be like everybody else so he smoked cigarettes and now he died because of it smoked himself to death big dummy anyway because he had to be like the people around him 
Uh, one classic example of reference group effect was a study done looking at African-American soldiers in 1949 while the South was still suffering through Jim Crow. The soldiers were less satisfied about living in the North than living in the repressive South. Could it be that they didn't like the better treatment and the obvious freedoms that they found in the North? With analysis, they found that the soldiers gave their answers because they were using local African Americans as their reference group. Because African Americans were better off in the North than the South, the soldiers' life was more satisfying in the South by comparison. Yeah, they were treated a lot better uh, in the North, but everybody was treated a lot better in the North if you're African American. Uh, than you, you were in the South. So your reference group was different. Your reference group was everybody was being treated as if they were the same as everybody else. Despite the fact that they were African American and in the South, of course, they are a denigrated, they were a denigrated population in 1949. Now the interesting thing is I have a friend that, that keeps talking about this and he's from the South and he sees it completely differently. He thinks that people in the South uh, actually treat African Americans better, even today, which, my goodness, if you, <laughs> if you read the news, you can tell that's not true. <laughs> but uh, that, he, he's, he uh, uses this research and says that people in the South treat uh, people better, uh, treat African Americans better, and they know it. When asked uh, how much people valued enjoying life and pleasure, the results showed that the dour East Germans, who you couldn't get them to smile unless blood was involved, somebody else's, of course, scored the third highest on the survey. They enjoyed life and they had more pleasure. Why? Because they were comparing themselves with the people around them, these really grouchy, grouchy people. <laughs> <laughs> Italians who maintain a lifestyle emphasizing good food, leisurely breaks in cafes, opera art, and long summer vacations came in next to last on the enjoying life and pleasure scale. Why? Because everybody in Italy was having a good time. And if you compare yourself with everybody having a good time, you're not really, you, you uh, uh, tend to score yourself a little bit lower. On the humility scale, the arrogant Americans scored higher on the scale than the humble Chinese. The collectivist Chinese scored higher on choosing one's own goals scale than the individualistic Americans. The deprivation effect involves people valuing things that they have little of rather than what they have in abundance. Thus, since there is a dearth of humbleness among Americans, they value humility more than the Chinese who were taught humility from birth. Subjective self-report measures work fine within cultures because cultural members tend to share the same response biases and reference groups. But subjective self-report measures do not work well between cultures because the members have different response styles and different re reference groups. So you really can't compare different cultures unless you do a really good job of selecting what your, uh, what your questions are, what you're going to be looking at. Cross-cultural studies are possible, but one variable that cannot be manipulated is cultural background. The comparisons of culture are not true experiments, but quasi-experiments. But quasi-experiments. Culture cannot be controlled, but other independent variables can. After randomly assigning subjects to groups, a researcher can administer different levels of the independent variable to each group. Any differences in their responses or behaviors that are observed must be due to the independent variable, as this is the only thing that differs systematically between the experimental conditions. A second method of doing cross-cultural research is within group manipulation. Each participant receives more than one level of independent variable. Within group manipulation does not require random assignment because each participant receives each level of the independent variable. Each participant also acts as their own control. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as magazine advertisements, and this was done by Hahn and Shabbat in 1994. Now, bizarre as this may be, this is an Oreo commercial. Milk's favorite cookie, and this is one from Korea. 
Um, and as you can see, the baby is, is suckling on his mother's uh, breast. Uh, and of course, he's waiting to eat his, his Oreo. <laughs> as weird as that may be. This would not be a com an advertisement that, uh, that would be shown in the United States or used in the United States. Uh, why? Because that would be uh, f considered inappropriate. But in Korea, it is appropriate. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as laws. And this was done by Cohen in 1996. Uh, China passed a law in 2013 that adult children must visit their parents often. Of course, it didn't, didn't uh, uh, tell us how often often is. Is that once a year, twice a year, once a month, once a week? How often is often? Uh, past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as newspaper articles. This was done by Morrison Ping in 1998, 1994. Uh, most headlines around the world uh, were about President Trump's inauguration, but with the country's point of view, or with that country's point of view, that was... Uh, in uh, 2017 when he was elected president. And of course, this is from Montreal, the Journal of Montreal. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's from their point of view, of course. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as fairy tales. This was done by Doyle and Doyle in 2001. Uh, the oldest written fairy tale actually was is a fairy tale called Abdullah the Fisherman and Abdullah the Merman, uh, written in 850 in Persia. And Persia is now Iran. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as children's stories. This is done by McClelland in 1961. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as sports coverage. This was done by Marcus Uchida. Omoregi, uh, Townsend, and Kadiyama, and of course I need to change that because that's not the way we we do uh, citations now with the DSM with the uh, APA seventh edition. I think we're on the seventh edition, aren't we? Or, or is it the sixth? I've got it right here. It's the seventh edition. Yes, it's the seventh edition. We don't do it that way anymore. That should be Marcus et al. Two thousand and six. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, I'll tell you what, if you're overseas, if you uh, go to England and you want to watch a sports show, uh, ESPN is not anything like it, it is in the United States. Everything is, is cricket, rugby, and uh, soccer. They're crazy about soccer. In the United States, we cover all sports. Uh, in other countries, uh, they only cover the major sports, and uh, they're quite adamant. A lot of arguing back and forth. Uh, past research has, has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as personal ads. And this is Perek and Berezin in 2001. Uh, past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as web pages. Masuda Ito and Rashid uh, in 2012. Uh, web pages. A key point to realize about research is that no single study is perfect. Every study has potential methodological shortcomings or alternative theoretical explanations. One important skill that, that students learn in graduate school in psychology is precisely how to come up with alternative explanations for virtually any study they encounter. And of course, that is an exercise that some professors would go through. I'm not really going to go through it uh, in, in, uh, in my studies. Uh, I just want you to know that uh, there's always more than one way to see things. Uh, and, of course, this is an example from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, do you think all these film crews brought on global warming, or did global warming bring on all these film crews? And, of course, that's two penguins uh, watching uh, people, uh, t uh, film crews, uh, talking about global warming. In science, researchers and readers of research, uh, they will use the principle of Occam's razor to help uh, with determining the quality of research. Occam's razor states that any theory should make as few assumptions as possible, shaving off any extraneous assumptions. 
All else held equal, Occam's razor maintains that the simpler theory is more correct. Uh, following Occam's razor, a single explanation is more parsimonious and more likely to be correct than four separate explanations. And that is Occam's razor. So if you've if you watch the Big Bang Theory, of course, this was a number of years ago, but they used to talk about Occam's razor all the time. It's always the simplest explanation. Research has always shown that the South is the most violent region in the United States, and that this has been true since the very founding of the nation. Uh, de Tocqueville, uh, in 1835, noticed this. De Tocqueville was a, uh, was a sociologist uh, from France, and he came to the United States to determine if the United States was developing into a country that could be trusted or whatever. Uh, and uh, so he traveled all over the United States and wrote extensively about what he saw. While violence exists in other regions of the country, the Old West, uh, for example, the South, uh, and of course the Old West has, has we watch cowboy movies, we don't watch uh, movies about uh, the South in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, 1880s or whatever. We don't really, there's no bad television shows. We could do that now because uh, the South has a lot more uh, murders. As you can see, this is uh, violent crimes in the South uh, is almost twice what it is in any other region of the country. Uh, while violence exists in other regions of the country, uh, the South has led the nation in lynchings, sniper attacks, feuds, homicides, and duels. Uh, the violent South, Andrew Jackson, the guy that's on the $20 bill, once killed a man in a duel over the honor of his wife, who at the time was married to both Jackson and her first husband while she waited for her divorce to be finalized. And he shot and killed the man because he mentioned the fact that his wife was a bigamist, which was true. Didn't make any difference. Uh, Jackson decided he would fight him. Fisher in uh, 1989 speculates that the South has always had more tolerance for aggressive pursuits. Reports from the colonial days uh, chronicle no holds barred fights where eyes were gouged and noses and ears were bitten off, or purring where two men held each other, uh, each other's shoulders and kicked each other in the shins until one let go. They filled them with uh, straw, by the way. This is what purring looks like, as dumb as it looks. The South, South has always been more tolerant than the North concerning corporal punishment of children, that's spanking, or whooping as they say in the South, capital punishment of criminals, gun ownership, going to war whenever the gauntlet is mentioned, Southern high school students are more likely to bring a weapon to school, the South has more school shootings than any other part of the country. Uh, the uh, six-year-old that shot the teacher was in Newport News, Virginia, which is part of the South. <clears throat> when I moved to Mississippi, we moved, uh, we were in, uh, stationed in Japan. This was in 1995. Uh, we were stationed in Japan, and uh, my mother-in-law was dying of uh, cancer, and so we were sent back to the only, uh, the opening is close to, uh, she lived in Atlanta, uh, so we moved back to uh, Mississippi because because it was the closest base we could get to to uh, uh, to Atlanta. And uh, the first thing I heard on on the radio this is in 1996. Uh, they were talking about whether whether whooping would be allowed in schools. They were still debating whether whether uh, the uh, students should be paddled. And of course, it uh, they they never wrote a, a law that uh, outlawed beating your child at school. There were there have been several theories as to why the South has evolved one way and uh, and the rest of the country another. And as we can see, violent crime is much lower in uh, other areas of the of the country, and it's very high in the South. It's like twice as high. Um, so why, why the South and why not other places in, in the United States? Hot, uncomfortable temperatures. Uh, the, and you guys say, well, come on. We, we're in 110, 112 degree heat all the time. 
your heat is dry. Their heat is is uh, humid. Their the uh, humidity level in the south is very high, and for that reason, it tends to be more uncomfortable. Uh, dry heat will pull the the moisture away from you. Uh, when you're you when it's hot in a humid area, uh, then it uh, it creates it won't allow your your sweat to uh, evaporate like it does in dry heat. Uh, so that's one of the one of the reasons Anderson in 1989 came up with that greater poverty in the south than any place else in the United States uh, they have a higher population of uh, of African Americans uh, when I was living in Mississippi in the 80s no that's not right in the 90s wait a minute oh I gave you the wrong dates uh, we were in Japan uh, the end of 94 and into 95. So I was in Mississippi from 95 through 98. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the poverty. <laughs> uh, when I was there in the 90s, uh, if you were African American, uh, you had a really difficult time finding a, finding a job. Uh, and and percentage of, of African Americans living in Mississippi at that time was one of the highest in the country. Uh, it's actually higher in South Carolina. Um, things are getting better, uh, but poverty among African Americans in the South is still quite high. There's a longer history of slavery where there is a tolerance for inhumane treatment, and that was according to de Tocqueville in 1835 as well. He was trying to, to understand why uh, the South was so violent. Nisbet and Cohen in 1996 posit that one factor that has led to more violence in the South is that the South was settled by herders, uh, which was given rise to a culture of honor. Uh, a culture of honor is one where men strive to protect their reputation through aggressive behavior. Herders are more susceptible to violence because their wealth is more portable where the land is more marginal. Uh, thus, it is important for herders to develop a reputation of violent reta retaliation to keep thieves away from their wealth, a culture of honor. Uh, the sense of honor has to be established before your wealth is affected. Thus, you need to be violent before anyone tries to steal your livestock. Show people that you are willing to fight for what you have. The herder culture of honor is not limited to the United States, but may have been brought here by the Scots-Irish, who made up the lion's share of people settling in the South. They were herders in the old country. Herders around the world maintained this bloviated code of honor and violence. Looking at archival uh, data, Nis Nisbet and uh, Cohen in 1997 found that when you compared records of the rural North with the rural South, they found that not only was the homicide rate higher, but when they compared herding regions of the South with farming regions of the South, the homicide rate was twice that in the herding region. So it's not only the, uh, the fact that you, you, you can not only take the, the South at, uh, in general, but if you separate the areas in the South uh, between farming regions and herding regions, the herding regions are far more violent than the farming regions. Cohen and Nisbet in 1994 next conducted telephone interviews of Northerners and Southerners and discovered that while they had similar negative feelings about violence, Southerners were more likely to have positive attitudes toward defending their families or their honor. Noting the testosterone rises when men are ready to aggress, Nisbet and Cohen et al. in 1996 arranged for northern and southern students to be put in a vaguely insulting situation. He then, um, they then measured uh, the testosterone of each participant. Measuring testosterone from saliva samples that researchers discovered uh, that while the northern students reacted minimally to the insult, uh, an increase of uh, 4 to 5 milligrams, or a level of 4 to 5 milligrams, the southern students were ready to aggress after the insult to a testosterone level of 12.5 from a level of 4 milligrams. In other words, they didn't have a, a abnormally high testosterone. It was about the same as the northerners, but when they were insulted, their testosterone uh, went up three times uh, 
and the northerners it only went up one milligram and sometimes it didn't go up at all uh, so honor was something very important Cohen and his colleagues in 1996 conducted a similar study where they forced their participants into a narrow hallway with a much larger person. What they were measuring was how long it took the participants to step out of the Man Mountain's Way, a game of human chicken. Human chicken. The situation was set up by either insulting the participant before they played hallway chicken or not. Northerners reacted in a similar manner whether they were insulted or not. Uh, they stepped out of the way uh, uh, 60 uh, inches if they weren't insulted. If they were insulted, oh, I'm sorry, 60 inches if they were insulted, uh, they stepped out of the way. 75 inches if they weren't insulted. Uh, 75 inches, I'm not exactly sure how far that is. We can divide that by 12 and, and get the feet. Uh, 6 feet is 72 inches, is that right? Yeah, 72 inches, so that's uh, 6 feet, step out of the way, or 10 feet is what it is. Southerners, on the other hand, stepped out of the way earlier when not insulted at 110 inches, um, which is almost 10 feet. That's not right. It is 10 feet. This is six feet. Okay, that is 10 feet down. Uh, of course, that's Southern hospitality, letting somebody go past. But after an insult, they approached the Man Mountain an average of 36 inches before veering off. 36 inches is a yard, uh, so they came really close to this guy. And of course, why? why? Because of the culture of honor was at play. And that is the end of the chapter. Uh, fun chapter. <laughs> My wife's from the South, but she doesn't have a temper. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but she does get in the way a lot. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you next week. Next week, we'll tackle chapter five.